Good afternoon, everyone, um, and a warm welcome to our audience also on the live stream, uh, which is webcast uh, on weforum.org. This is the issue briefing on corruption and anti-corruption, an issue that's very uh, close to the forum's agenda. It's actually one of our 10 global challenges. And uh, as you know, the forum is concerned with issues like competitiveness and growth, and corruption plays an important role here. It's a, it's a big hurdle to growth. And uh, I'll, with that, I'll pass on. Um, oh, no, let me first introduce the panel, of course, because we have a very, very distinct uh, pa panel here today. Um, and true to the forum's multi-stakeholder approach, we do have all important sectors represented. To my immediate left is uh, Elaine Dysensky. She is a senior director with the World Economic Forum and has been heading the efforts of the World Economic Forum in anti-corruption for several years, in particular the Partnering Against Corruption Initiative, PACHI. To her left is Stephen Almond, who is the global chairman of Deloitte, who will share the, the business perspective uh, on corruption here. Uh, further to the left is Dr. Kobus de Swart, who is the managing director of Transparency International, who will share the view from the civil sector perspective. And all the way to the left is Mr. Angel Juria, who is the Secretary General of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And without further ado, I'll uh, hand over to my colleague, Elaine Nisensky. Elaine. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I would start with a bit of the, the context around the corruption conversation uh, here in Davos. Uh, I think when we talk about corruption from the forum perspective, we see it as one of the key elements to unlocking global growth. And this is really a good place to start. Uh, it's, it's about corruption as um, a moral issue, but it's also about corruption uh, as an impediment. Uh, and as I think about the, the many topics that come up over the course of this, this week in Davos, whether it's trust in leadership, uh, what to do about fragile states, uh, thinking about geopolitical risk and the uncertainty right now in the economic system, inevitably there is some sort of link back to corruption as a core driver of this uh, instability. And I think that's an important uh, element of where we go around this conversation in the future. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, opportunity during this week in Davos to meet with CEOs from all over the world. Uh, 25 of whom came together yesterday as part of our Apache Vanguard uh, community to talk about um, what corruption means to them, uh, dealing with it uh, proactively within um, their industry sectors, within their organizations in some cases, and what they can do collectively to start changing the dynamics in the marketplace um, to bring about something closer to a transparent and level playing field. And so this is really the core of the conversation with the business community, um, which also drives a conversation with our international partners, with governments, with NGOs around a real collaboration. And as George mentioned, um, this idea of having a global uh, challenge, a list of global challenges within the forum, uh, including corruption, is, is quite important and, and signifies that, in fact, this is an institutional priority, but it reflects the membership of the, of the forum as well uh, and the need to really be thinking about some creative solutions uh, in this space. Uh, so one of the uh, key issues that, that we'll be moving on in the next year as we further develop the anti-corruption agenda is a, a partnership um, to really uh, put forward some strong uh, recommendations and implementation based on the agenda of the B20 and the G20 dialogues on anti-corruption. And this is important because the G20, B20 uh, process is what we think is the closest to uh, achieving an aligned global agenda across business, government, including civil society, and in fact, the partners here uh, on the press, uh, press dais have all been involved in this process of creating a set of recommendations that we think will have great impact around the anti-corruption arena. Uh, it includes topics like beneficial ownership, uh, collective action, uh, working with small and medium-sized enterprises, and really building out the capacity in both the public sector and the private sector to deal with some pretty thorny issues. So as we move forward this year, we're going to be uh, launching this partnership around this B20 process, and we think uh, that that's going to lead to some really interesting opportunities to implement a very strong uh, agenda around anti-corruption. Thank you, Elaine. Stephen, over to you. Uh, thank, thanks very much. As I'm here to represent the uh, business community, let me start with a very simple statement, which is this. Uh, in the fight against corruption, government and business are on the same side, or they certainly should be, uh, because for companies, 
corruption adds hugely to the cost of doing business uh, in enhancing systems and controls, recruiting staff with uh, subject matter expertise in countering corruption, and in uh, training other staff. For governments, corruption has a massively negative impact on really key investment programs in areas like infrastructure, health, uh, education, all of which should drive social prosperity and social progress, whereas corruption actually drives exactly the opposite, social inequality and instability, as uh, Elaine uh, just alluded to. And, and governments need business to get involved in those major investment programs. The risk is that business where they feel that the risk, where, where they're dealing in markets where uh, corruption is rife, uh, are likely to reduce their investment and look elsewhere for business opportunities and job creation opportunities, uh, where uh, they are concerned that the risk of sanctions, or even worse, the risk to their reputation, their most valuable single asset, uh, outweigh the potential economic benefits uh, of investing in that particular market. So I think we're all agreed that corruption is is bad for business, is bad for uh, governments, it's certainly very, very bad for society as a whole. So we do need business and government to get on the same side and be very vocal about it. Elaine just alluded to the G20, B20 effort. I was on the B20 effort in 2014, and we did come up with three, uh, well, a number of very simple um, recommendations for the G20, uh, three of which I'll just elucidate, which is designed to level the playing field for business investment. And, and that was one, simply harmonize the existing legislation and provide incentives to business to self-report uh, when they try and transgress, when they fail to comply. Second, uh, get all the G20 companies to sign up to the principles uh, adopted by the G8 relating to beneficial ownership and transparency about shell companies, which perhaps COBIS will uh, uh, pick up on. And thirdly, similarly, get all the G20 company, countries to sign up to either the OECD anti-bribery convention or the UN's equivalent, the Convention uh, Against Corruption. But it's not just about adequate legislation and uh, enforcement, although that is very important. And it's not just about companies complying, although that equally is very important. I think we need a new approach uh, to combating corruption where the relationship between business and government moves from one that is often seen as being adversarial to one that is very much rooted in working together. And this needs real commitment. You know, we, we've set out recommendations for government, but it also needs real commitment from the business community. We need more CEOs to take personal ownership of this issue, really be passionate about it, engage their executive teams, and be passionate about it in their communications with all of their own people, which says quite simply that any, any uh, corrupt activity is simply incompatible with their company's values and will not be tolerated. Now, business leaders also need help from government and civil society in, in getting, getting ahead of this, but they can help each other, which is why I think the Forum's Partnership Against Corruption Vanguard initiative is really so timely and so important, bringing together CEOs to exchange knowledge, share best practices, just come together collectively and with their supply chains to help build capacity level the playing field, as I said, and establish, hopefully, fair market conditions for all stakeholders. Thank you, Stephen, for sharing these insights from the business perspective. Uh, over to you, Kobus. What do you say, uh, what are the main issues from a civil society perspective? What's Trans Transparency International most worried about at this point? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll share three remarks with you. Firstly, <coughs> to significantly deal with the majority of national level corruption around the world will take many years, if not many decades. However, to deal significantly with the majority of all international corruption around the world mm. is something that's achievable within a few years. It is exactly the technology that today facilitate corruption 
internationally, worldwide, that are also the kind of technologies that can be used to fight that corruption. That's a very different world that we were in 10 years ago. And that's why, on an international level, it is the lack of political will that remains the major obstacle in fighting corruption. The technologies that allow the illicit flow of uh, illicit financial flows, that prevent the exchange of tax information, that make public registers of beneficial ownership difficult, are also the technologies that facilitate them. So it's in this context that I go to my second point, where the work of the B20 and the G20 become particularly important, because those are currently the strongest instruments that we have to move these issues on international corruption. And let me talk briefly on uh, beneficial ownership. The secrecy that accompanies uh, the hiding of the real owners of companies around the world is indeed a massive problem. If you look at the World Bank, they studied uh, 213 biggest anti-corruption, uh, grand corruption cases over the last 30 years. In the absolute majority of those, Secret companies was the vehicle used to facilitate corruption. The Financial Action Task Force looked at 32 biggest cases. 28 of those used secret companies to facilitate corruption. The problem is massive. And if you think about it, there's nobody, I believe, in this room today that will get on a commercial airline if there's no list of the passengers and if there's not basic security on the luggage. And yet we allow secret companies to undermine our economies, to bring instability to our economies around the world without doing any basic due diligence on that. It seems ludicrous, but that is the situation we still find ourselves in. Currently, this brings economic benefits to some of the rich world but it brings economic instability to them in the medium to long run, and its impact on the developing world is devastating indeed. It has to be tackled. Lastly, what are the things that can immediately be done, particularly in terms of beneficial ownership? Three points. Firstly, international cooperation and exchange of information. There I think the B20 and the G20 are moving. Secondly, it should become a requirement across the world that all companies that bid for public contracts must have public registers of their beneficial owners. This will arguably, on my continent, Africa, deal with a very large section of public contracts that are either under suspicion of corruption or suffer from corruption in an instant way. And thirdly, we would like to see public registers of beneficial ownership across the world. It has been shown that this is possible, this is much more cost effective, and there are no reason for any company that is looking for a level playing field to not support that. So hopefully uh, we've seen some movements over the last uh, 18 months with governments uh, moving in that direction. It is not good enough to have registers of beneficial ownership without them being in the public domain and will continue to push for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this powerful call for action. Uh, Mr. Guri, uh, uh, do you share uh, Kobus de Swart's optimism on the, on the B20 and, and G20 agenda? Uh, yes, uh, and also it's not about optimism or pessimism, it's about activism. We just got to get on with it, you know. And, and sometimes we'll get it right, sometimes we won't. We've just got to get on with it, just persevere. Uh, and, and uh, well, was it uh, the classic said, try, try again, you know, if at first you don't succeed. So, uh, and this is, this is a learning curve. This is not a science, it's an art. Um, and, you know, OECD foreign bribery report, analysis of the crime of bribery of foreign public officials. Well, we just put this one out. It's 15 years of the anti-bribery convention, which I'm the depository at the OECD with the other. And uh, so 427 concluded cases of bribery uh, against uh, foreign public officials. Um, it shows the companies are still engaged in corrupt transactions at the highest level. Interesting, in more than half of the cases, corporate management 
was involved. So the myth of the rogue uh, employee uh, is debunked. You know, that means this is, goes all, all the way. The report highlights we cannot take a one-dimensional approach uh, to combating corruption, focusing just on companies or just on government. And here, I'd like to say that uh, Stephen Almond's comment about this is, you know, takes two to tango, is absolutely both to create the problem, but also to resolve it, therefore. Mm. No? And uh, now, um, the, the focusing here, the, it's the supply and the demand. You know, the, 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 the whole logic of the anti-bribery convention was created on the basis that supply will, you know, you deal with the supply, you take care of the thing. Now, every single country in the world has at least one company that is doing transnational business. And therefore, everybody is subject to the same temptations, to the same problems. So everybody should participate on both sides of the, of the, of the aisle. Um, and also, you know, if we had to focus on one issue, because we don't have the manpower, we don't have the knowledge, or we don't have the body, what do you do with it? Well, two-thirds of the case, this corruption occurred in public procurement opportunities. So it's not the only case, you know, permits, licensing, all sorts of interactions between governments and authorities and the public uh, may lead to some kind of corruption, but it's in public procurement where it happens uh, the most, or at least where we've identified it the most, so f focus on that. We're also putting enforcement and implementation at the heart of the work on anti-corruption. We, we launched an OECD trust and business project, precisely focusing on how to close the implementation gap between the actual conduct of business and uh, the governments and the, the rules and standards that we put forward. So how, how do you make it happen? These rules and standards include, among others, uh, our anti-bribery convention, but also the work of the G20 and the B20. And here we have we invited our Sherpa, who is the one in charge of t taking the message to the G20, but also working with the B20 with all our uh, directorates so that uh, we can support the B20 to then the B20 input into the G20 on this particular issue. Um, the next round of country reviews by our, our working group on bribery will focus on enforcement, not just on the legal framework, but whether it, this is actually happening. Uh, first, the legal framework, fine. Then you get you know, best practices, but then are you working on sanctions? And of course, we still have many countries that we have found to be chemically pure because they are, you know, nothing happens there. Or maybe they don't have the political will. If they are chemically pure, we should clone them. But if it doesn't happen that they're chemically pure, they just don't have the political will, we should push them. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, naming and shaming, but uh, there was a suggestion in one of our meetings that we should also have naming and faming uh, because we should encourage uh, a proper uh, uh, best practices and best behaviors. And we should, you know, reward the companies that actually have these best practices, that have uh, compliance officers and that are worried about this, and the governments that are doing it, uh, like, like the Colombians who have this ombudsman uh, about corruption, you know, this, this, this should become best practices. Um, and we should uh, take a look at that. And then um, somebody said, like, instead of whistleblowers, trumpet blowers. Uh, because, uh, you know, whistleblowers for the bad things, trumpet blowers for the good things, you know. So, again, uh, stress the positive uh, incentives also. But also, I say also, the other, the bad stuff also we have to keep in the books. So, uh, the question of beneficial ownership. Well, I think Kobus made the point very well, and so did everybody else, about why this is uh, very critical. But let me tell you another dimension. With beneficial ownership, we'll never know who pays taxes or doesn't pay taxes. Multinationals don't pay taxes, among other things, because nobody knows who owns them or who should be asked to pay the taxes. And we still have beneficial ownership black holes in some of the most developed of our own countries, okay? Mm -hmm. In the United States, in the UK, et cetera, we have problems of beneficial ownership. And we should address those first before we are going around demanding from third parties or third countries or developing countries to come and, you know, to join the fray. Uh, we should preach by example, and we should be, uh, you know, in that sense, impeccable. Um, now, in terms of joining the convention, we've been trying to encourage, uh, you know, uh, the, of the large emerging economies. China is not yet a member. 
Uh, India is not yet a member. Uh, Indonesia is not yet a member. But many of the others are members already. And we, of course, uh, uh, welcome uh, them to, to join. But beneficial ownership, absolutely, uh, totally critical. Uh, and let me just uh, uh, finish with one more uh, area where uh, transparency and where the combat against corruption is already starting to produce results. On the tax area, we have 124 countries on a global forum on um, exchange of information. We're now moving to automatic exchange of information. And lo and behold, 37 billion euros have already been received in the coffers of the countries that would not be there were it not for this effort to go for the transparency. And last but not least, the BEPS project, base erosion and profit shifting, where we already said beneficial ownership, one of the elements, transfer pricing, et cetera, in order, again, to make it possible for uh, multinational companies to pay their uh, fair share. So all invited, 23rd of March, OECD Annual Integrity Week, where uh, we're going to get all uh, representatives of, all, of society, all the stakeholders, to join us um, uh, to uh, take the effort uh, further. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. I think this was a wonderful overview of the different perspectives on the matter, and I think there's a lot of common ground, uh, as we learned. We'll open the floor for questions now. For the benefit of our online audience, if you could state your name and your organization. Uh, we have a microphone available, so please, uh, John. John Halpern, Associated Press. Uh, this question uh, has to do with international organizations uh, which uh, do business by procuring the services or goods of uh, companies, businesses, work with governments, et cetera, and the organizations themselves enjoy some privileges and immunities. I'm just wondering, on the one hand, they're under pressure to appear to be transparent. On the other hand, airing their dairy la their dirty laundry uh, is bad for business in the sense of um, dampening donor uh, donations uh, can lead to political complications when you need deals made, et cetera, um, in terms of political deal making. Um, I'm just wondering, in that situation, um, what do you see as the levers for improving that situation um, and getting the more than, it just seems like there's only maybe a few governments out there that truly have the, the wherewithal or the, um, the desire or the ability to pressure organizations to be more transparent, to truly be more transparent, and reveal what they found. Um, what kind of leverage, if you agree with that assessment, and what kind of leverage do you think there is to improve that dynamic? Thank you. Thank you, John. And if you could just pass the microphone on, I think we have a second question from the gentleman there. Uh, David Sirota with International Business Times. I have really two questions. One is um, the question of how you define corruption. Uh, in, is corruption defined as large campaign contributions uh, that are disclosed in a place like the United States in exchange for public contracts, for instance? Does that count as corruption? If not, why not? Uh, and my second question is um, about transparency. Um, uh, there's an issue in the United States about transparency in a particular form of public contracting around pensions. Uh, private equity firms uh, say that they will not want, they don't want to release uh, the terms of their uh, uh, deals with state governments. Uh, I know KKR is, works with, for instance, Transparency International. KKR has uh, threatened state governments if state governments uh, disclose the terms of their agreements uh, with uh, private equity companies. Uh, and there have been allegations of corruption in awarding of those contracts. Uh, I'd be curious transpa what, about Transparency International's work with KKR and also the general idea of how can there be transparency to fight <coughs> corruption uh, when companies say that they need uh, a lack of transparency to protect trade secrets and com so-called commercial secrets. Thank you, David. Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, shall I have a go at the, the first and the last comment? Um, about companies' efforts and barriers around uh, transparency, which I think are, are really good uh, questions. Uh, and it is very complex. Um, but I, I think there are some very good examples of collective action um, from the business community. Uh, in fact, I think the Partnership Against Corruption initiative that I 
referenced in my comments actually had its origins in the extractive industries that originally got together and said, this is not something we should be competing about uh, because it's a shared problem. And uh, uh, so I think, and there are a lot of other sectoral efforts where leading CEOs have just come together and said, let's, let's work together to find solutions to dealing with these issues about uh, transparency. Um, I say this is not something we should compete on. But it does come, uh, equally, you do get to pressures where those same companies get to, a, uh, con get to concerns that are we being so transparent that actually we're going into areas where we do compete? Uh, and, and where do you strike that balance? So there's no easy answer to that. But I think, that, I think collective action is a good way forward to find a way, find a path, as I said earlier, uh, for, for companies to learn from each other. And also, from the government point of view, uh, we touched on it, one or two of us touched on this idea of uh, providing incentives to companies to reward good behavior, uh, to, provide, uh, so to provide some mitigation where companies do uh, acknowledge their shortcomings and do self-report that there is some recognition, not not absolving them from the the uh, their wrongdoings, but some recognition for their willing for the strength of their compliance programs in the first place that will enable them to find the issues, and then the strength of their character in coming forward and and answering it. Another idea, uh, so there were some references to uh, public procurement programs. Uh, so another idea that came out of the B20 was perhaps uh, uh, Cobus talked about the beneficial ownership side, but also uh, making it a condition of any company that wants to bid for a high, for a major uh, infrastructure project to to demonstrate and ha meet a sort of kite mark standard for their compliance programs, or alternatively, if they don't have such a program, actually they get docked marks in there in the assess in the evaluation of their bids but these are all short steps on you know what is going to be a marathon so they're good questions but those are some some suggestions of steps towards solution thank you very much Stephen and I think there were questions about the can campaign contributions I think Kobus, this one was uh, directed at you so please if you could uh, answer that one yeah, maybe a, a twofold uh, answer firstly starting with definition uh, Broadly speaking, uh, corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Uh, but what we've seen over the last couple of years in particular is that the forms that corruption can take are ind indeed much more varied. Um, and particularly when you look at the financial crisis and you look at the whole global financial system, a lot of this would not have been classified as corruption, but were actually practices that uh, by their very nature undermine the public good, uh, and, f and for that one needs to uh, have a, a look at that again. In terms of how and who we work with, we've got an approach that we have a critical but constructive engagement with all stakeholders. And that's very simple from the premise. If we were to say we will only work with companies or governments that have no problems, I think we will live on an island somewhere. This, this is indeed a journey of transparency. and and. Here, uh, I can give you one example. Uh, what would be a, a big game changer in the world is if we had a neutral, complete list of all political exposed persons in the public domain. To get from where we are today, where this is a highly politicized areas, who's classified as peps, who's not, to where you have complete neutral list, that road to transparency is indeed similar to what needs to be tackled when you look at uh, campaign financing, when you look at issues of pension fund transparency. What is very clear is that it is irreversible that we're going to get there. The question is, will we get there in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years' time? One of the most critical ones is indeed the issue of how money in politics have eroded public confidence in political systems. And that's why, if you ask me, is that one that I think is of particular importance? Yes. And there, the US example has shown that mere transparency is not enough on it either. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we've never been told by anybody not to publish anything we know. So uh, uh, I just would like to say that we have published anything we, we, we had uh, intended to publish. and. Uh, 
the the only problem is we we wish we would have had more. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I, I'd like to start from there. But there are many many angles. Um, the the question of trust here is critical, uh, and 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 a lot of the loss of the trust comes precisely because there, there's this, this perception that these things are not a level playing field. The taxes, this is big. That's a big issue. Uh, and it's a form of theft. And yeah, that means you take a few pennies from every single citizen because they're going to have to pay more taxes because you didn't or because a particular company didn't. Or, or the, all the small and medium enterprises of a company, of a country, are going to have to pay more because the large multinationals don't pay taxes. So when we're talking about BEPS, it's not about pointing fingers at anybody. You, you want to encourage companies to invest, you want, but you want also everybody to put their fair share. We are insisting as much on avoiding double taxation as on avoiding double non-taxation, okay? So, you know, it's, it's very important that we make this clear. This is not about, you know, uh, avoiding uh, or not. It, it's about everybody doing, you know, what they have to do, doing their fair share. We created the system. Individuals avoid taxes at their own peril because they're violating the law. Companies avoid taxes because they're using a system that we created over the last 80 years to avoid double taxation. So what they do is legal. It might not be right, but it's legal. So that is why this second challenge is much more difficult because we have to change the rules, not just, you know, change the practices. So now... Bribes is a different question because, you know, you say, how do you define, you know, corruption? Well, it's, it's like, uh, you know, in many, it's difficult. It's, it's in many codes and practically every single code, uh, both domestic uh, corruption as well as foreign corruption. But it's also one way where you see when there is corruption is it's much more than just taking money home in your pocket for your own bank account. Uh, you mentioned a case of at least distortions of uh, you know, campaign contributions, mm -hmm. Copas mentioned. You, you're talking about the last campaign cost, what, a, a billion or something like that? Uh, and then uh, the court, the Supreme Court, came up with uh, author uh, authorization that the PACs and the super PACs could put up, you know, enormous amounts of money, not for a candidate, for, for a cause. And therefore, you know, it allowed a new um, uh, crowd, you know, a, a new generation of monies to go into the campaigns. And what is it about? It's avoid. Uh, it's about avoiding capture. It's about avoiding capture, which you just said. It is not just about contracts. It's about policy. You know, policy or policies that would favor a particular group that were generous, you know, in the campaign. So it's not just about taking money home. The other question is about financing democracies. How many g political giants, you know, have fallen because they didn't take a penny home? But they wanted to finance the campaigns. They wanted to finance their parties uh, through, you know, some indirect, uh, inappropriate way. Uh, and, you know, that's uh, very important. Now, uh, let me just, uh, I, I have to say also, uh, every donation, every penny of donation is public in the U.S. And every penny of contracts is public. Therefore, there, it's at least a little, you know, easier to look at both sides and denounce it if there's something else. Um, uh, the, the, the question of, you know, contracts and pensions are particular issues, I think. The question is, how does one, uh, with better information, with greater transparency, but also, you know, with greater awareness of the question of what's going on and how that actually affects uh, the public uh, in the broadest sense. Uh, and, and, you know, I think this is what we're all... Yeah, in fact, we won't be able to, to cover all of these uh, particular issues at this press conference. Sorry to step in, but uh, I'm being told uh, that we might have uh, just time for one last uh, question with brief answers. Um, so I understand the gentleman in the back has a question. question. Has been answered. That's even better. Uh, that means we can close on time. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. Thank you very much for, for coming. And thank you uh, particularly to, to this great panel. I think it was a great discussion. And uh, you, can, uh, you can go to uh, um, www.weforum.org to watch the live stream. Uh, you can later download it. And you can follow us on social media for additional information on Patchy and the Patchy Vanguard. Thank you very much.